trichotillomania, perhaps one of the most distressing disorders known. Those grappling with the disorder often describe it as defeating, consuming, and inducing a sense of paranoia. Indeed, living with this disorder poses multiple barriers in day-to-day -day life. Hello, my name is Sardine Macab. Today, our focus turns to a comprehensive exploration of trichotillomania. Beginning with the objective insights based on clinical research, we will then dive into the personal nuanced complexities associated with the disorder. Without further ado, let's begin. People with trichotillomania lead diverse lives. While some are capable of carrying out regular daily tasks, others may find themselves hindered by their condition. But what exactly is trichotillomania? Often abbreviated as TRIC, trichotillomania is a mental health disorder characterized by recurring irresistible urges to pull out one's own hair. Commonly referred to as the hair pulling disorder, individuals afflicted by TRIC often find themselves trapped in a relentless cycle of hair pulling episodes. These episodes typically result in instant gratification, but are then met with overwhelming feelings of shame, guilt, and inner turmoil. Trichotillomania spares no one, even affecting the youngest among us. Children as young as 12 months to 5 years old can display symptoms of trick. However, in this age group, the condition is typically short-lived, often occurring as part of their exploration and self-discovery process. The more severe form of trichotillomania typically emerges in children aged 10 to 13 years old. Approximately 3.5 of these children will carry the symptoms into adulthood. Among adolescent patients, trichotillomania is gender neutral. Among adults, about 0.5 to 3.4% will experience trich at some point in their lives. Interestingly, the demographic is significantly skewed. Adult women outnumber adult men at a ratio of 9 to 1. One speculated reason for this unbalance is because trichotillomania as a whole is severely underreported due to its stigmatization. Worldwide, trichotillomania has a prevalence of 0.5 to 2%, so approximately 1 in 200 to 1 in 50 people have or has had a case of trich. Symptoms of trichotillomania are as follows. Repeatedly pulling out hair, an increasing sense of tension before pulling, a sense of pleasure or relief after the hair is pulled, preferences for specific textures of hair, biting, chewing, or eating pulled out hair, playing with or rubbing pulled out hair across your face or lips, noticeable hair loss on the scalp, body, or sites where hair was pulled, unsuccessful attempts to stop, and finally, significant distress at work, school, or in social situations. The onset of trichotillomania is sneaky. Oftentimes, the patient may not realize they have trichotillomania. When symptoms first arise, a patient may comb through their hair without much thought. They may find that the brushing effect is soothing and that the plucking of hairs is normal. The patient is not aware, but they have fallen into a hair pulling episode and may continue these episodes multiple times a day or week. Patients may take their strands and chew on them, even swallowing the hair is a known occurrence in this disorder. Patients may also roll their strands into rings or tumbleweeds and fidget with or rub them into their face and lips. These episodes feel so good that the actions go unnoticed at first. Eventually, the patient may catch on after noticing significant hair loss, but being aware of this destructive habit is not enough. Depending on the severity of the disorder, the tension to pull is still there, and the urges become stronger, turning into full-blown compulsions. Patients often find themselves relapsing, even after numerous attempts to stop, and this can lead to noticeable changes in their appearance or behavior. As a result, these habits become a notable source of distress in their daily lives. Causes of trichotillomania are inconclusive as there are no robust number of studies out there, but there are a number of speculated causes based on what is. The first, genetic. If a family member has trichotillomania, their close relatives are likely to develop it if circumstances permit. A study involving 34 sets of twins, with 24 identical and 10 non-identical, where at least one of them had trichotillomania, revealed that 58.3% of identical twins shared their disorder, compared to 20% of non-identical twins. This points to a heritability estimate of 76.2%. The second speculated cause, brain structure or chemistry. 
In small neuroimaging studies, scientists have found changes in the size of the inferior frontal gyrus and the cerebellum. Specifically, in patients with trichotillomania, the inferior frontal gyrus was thicker and cerebellar volumes were reduced compared to controls. In the case of brain chemistry, a study showed patients with trichotillomania had increased gray matter densities in the left striatum, left amygdalo hippocampal formation, and in multiple cortical regions. Both studies had limitations. Because both had small groups of participants, the scientists suggested the need for further research. The third cause, emotional stress. Negative tension rises in people who are dealing with stressful times or challenging circumstances. The sensation offered by hair pulling often releases this tension, soothing the person. And in doing so, the hair pulling often becomes a sustained coping mechanism. Boredom also contributes to the development of trichotillomania. Prolonged states of boredom may negatively affect one's emotions, potentially leading to increased tension and the development of hair pulling habits in patients. According to the APA's DSM-5 manual, a patient has to meet five of the criteria to be diagnosed with trichotillomania. Criteria A. The patient must be removing hair from a body region. Criteria B. The patient must have tried to stop or decrease hair removal. Criteria C. The removal must cause significant distress or impairment in at least one area of functioning. Criteria D. The hair pulling or loss cannot be caused by another medical condition, example alopecia areata. Criteria E. The hair pulling is not better explained by some other mental disorder and its symptoms. It is said that the actions of trichotillomania are similar to those in OCD, and it is true that trichotillomania falls under the spectrum of obsessive-compulsive related disorders, but the two are separate and have key differences. The compulsions driven by OCD are manifested through intrusive thoughts. In contrast, the compulsions of trichotillomania are manifested through stress or anxiety. Additionally, the pleasure provided by the hair pulling and trick produces positive emotions and relief. OCD does not provide pleasures in the same manner. It is common for a trick patient to be misdiagnosed with OCD, and about 13 to 27 percent of trick patients have co-occurring OCD. Congruently, 4.9 to 6.9 percent of OCD patients have trichotillomania. Those with trichotillomania often enter a trance-like state where they are completely focused on pulling, oftentimes not even knowing they are doing it. People become fixated on finding the right hair to pull, and it becomes very difficult to stop once having started. This quote perfectly describes the compulsive urge of trichotillomania. Patients are usually under a great deal of stress, and because it is suggested that hair pulling regulates emotional states, pulling may function as a means for a person to escape from or avoid aversive experiences. Hair follicles contain special nerve endings wrapped around the base, and stimulation from these nerve endings provide a soothing sensation to their owner. The more someone stimulates themselves, the more dopamine is produced, and because the patient is producing this rewarding sensation with hair pulling, the temporary relief from their negative emotions may maintain the behavior through a negative reinforcement cycle. Because hair pulling acts as a direct and easy solution for emotional stress, the behavior is next to impossible to stop. The case vignette, offered by Dr. John E. Grant and Dr. Samuel R. Chamberlain, examines the experience of a 22-year-old patient referred to as Mrs. G. Mrs. G tended to pull hair during times of stress, but only on approximately 50% of the occasions was she aware she was doing it. The rest of the time, she reported that she pulled automatically and would notice a pile of hair on the floor or on her desk when she had snapped out of it. Mrs. G was only aware of her hair pulling about 50% of the time. This is a phenomenon known as automatic pulling, where patients report not being fully aware of their pulling behaviors. In contrast, focus pulling is when a patient is fully aware of their actions. In addition to the compulsive urges of trick, automatic pulling adds another layer of challenge when attempting to halt the behavior, making it especially intricate. Not only is trichotillomania mentally draining, it can also be very damaging to the body. There are several adverse bodily effects associated with the disorder. If picking and pulling had been sustained for prolonged periods of time, the patient may find patches of bald spots or thinning hair. Depending on the intensity of the picking, permanent hair loss is a possibility if follicles are damaged. Common areas where bald spots are present include, but are not limited to, the occipital, temporal, and vertex regions of the head. Hands are also not always used to fondle with the hair. 
Tools such as tweezers, scissors, and brushes can also be used. If tools are used, patients face higher risks for skin damage and scarring. Depending on the severity, this may call for surgical repair such as skin grafting. Additionally, it has been noted that approximately 5 to 20% of patients eat their hair after pulling, a phenomenon called trichophagia. If enough hair is ingested, complications such as gastrointestinal obstruction and trichobizors may arise. A trichobizor is a formation of hairballs that block the digestive system and may also cause perforation or hemorrhaging, which can be fatal or require surgery. There are mixed studies on the commonality of trichobizors, however. If a trich patient has been ingesting hair and feels pain, nausea, constipated, or vomiting, a trichobizor should be sought. One time, while giving each other makeovers at a sleepover in elementary school, my friend noticed I had no eyelashes. Her first reaction was, Ew, gross. What happened to your eyes? Looking back, I know she didn't mean anything bad by it, but it still hurt. The other girls came to look, and there I was singled out in front of everyone. This happened at school, at doctor's appointments, and even from strangers. So it's safe to say I never really wanted to leave my house or look people in the eyes. Given the impact trichotillomania has on physical health, it's to be expected that one's mental well-being would also be affected. Constantly fighting the urges to pull, combined with a deteriorated appearance, can lead patients to develop feelings of shame and embarrassment. Anxiety-like thoughts and actions can manifest, leading patients to constantly question their appearance and develop a withered sense of self-esteem. Exhausting efforts are taken to hide their physical appearance, wearing hats or wigs, hair extensions, faux eyelashes, faux eyebrows, frequent shavings. Even when these measures are taken, fear lingers in their minds for whether someone will notice or if an accident might occur. That being said, if you notice physical symptoms of trick in a person, it is extremely crucial not to point them out, as it may exacerbate stress and will do more harm than good. Instead, if you must acknowledge it, ask them questions pertaining more to how they feel or about what is stressing them out, and don't press the issue. The weight of this anxiety is so compelling that in some cases, a patient may develop a condition called psychosocial dysfunction. Psychosocial dysfunction is defined as when someone with a mental health condition interacts with a social environment that presents barriers to their equality with others. Illness is characterized by a prolonged negative mood, inability to feel pleasure, and impaired cognition. Nearly one-third of adult trich patients reported a low quality of life. In cases where trichotillomania was severe, individuals frequently reported failure to pursue job advancements, job interviews, dating, or leaving the house in general. A study of 894 adult trich patients found that 6% used illegal drugs, 17.7% used tobacco products, and 14.1% used alcohol as a way to cope with their negative feelings associated with hair pulling. It is uncommon for trick patients to seek help from mental health professionals. According to one study of 1,048 individuals, only 39.5% had sought treatment from a therapist, and only 27.3% sought treatment from a psychiatrist. Low rates of treatment seeking are due to a multitude of reasons. About 87% of trick patients feel providers know very little about the disorder. Trick patients are not aware their condition is a mental health disorder. Shame from associated stigma keeps the patient from reporting, and trick patients fear the reactions and consequences from their providers. The first line of help trick patients seek are usually primary care doctors or dermatologists. If these professionals deem the bot spots unrelated to conditions such as alopecia or anemia, the patient will then be directed to a mental health professional as appropriate. 83% of patients report anxiety and 70% report depression as a result of compulsive hair pulling. Therefore, cases related to trichotillomania will usually be screened for secondary manifestations when curating a treatment plan. There is no cure for trichotillomania, and treatment is riddled with relapses and remissions. However, about 50% of patients experience a reduction of symptoms in the short term. So, how is trichotillomania treated? Trichotillomania is treated with therapy, medication, or both. Given that trichotillomania may come with comorbidities, psychiatrists may prescribe medications associated with the co-occurrences. Interestingly, studies on the use of medication as treatment yielded mixed results. 
Nutraceuticals seem to be the most efficient, ranking them first. A study of 50 adults who either received a placebo or 1200 milligrams of NAC for 12 weeks showed that 56% of patients who took NAC displayed a reduction in symptoms compared to 16% of patients who took the placebo. Second were antipsychotics. In one study, 18 patients were subjected to a three-month trial with olanzapine as therapy. Hair pulling decreased by 66% and anxiety decreased by 63%, with four patients having a complete remission of symptoms. Third came SSRIs, producing scattered results. One study of 16 patients were given 12 weeks of fluoxetine, 80 milligrams, followed by 12 weeks of a placebo and found no difference in symptoms from either period. However, a study with the tricyclic antidepressant, clomipramine, observed 13 women for 10 weeks and showed better results as nearly all the women reported a decrease in the compulsion to pull their hair. And fourth came anticonvulsants. 14 adults received topiramate at dosages of 50 to 250 milligrams a day for 16 weeks and only six were responders noting that their symptoms did not decrease. The most common first line of treatment is therapy, specifically habit reversal training. Just as the name implies, the core fundamental is to reverse bad habits and uses an array of methods to do so. Habit reversal training programs involve awareness training, where patients learn to identify the triggers, situations, and emotions that precede a hair pulling episode, competing response training, Patients learn to replace the hair pulling for other actions. An example would be instead of pulling hair, the patient will clench a fist or fidget with an object. Social support networks. Patients are encouraged to involve family or friends to reinforce accountability and to encourage a supportive atmosphere. Relaxation training. The patient learns relaxation techniques like deep breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, or mindfulness to manage anxiety and tension that proceeds to urge to pull. A study of 60 participants in a two-step treatment program, step one being 10 weeks of self-help strategies, and step two being an eight-week in-person habit reversal training program, saw 76% of the patients progress to step two. And those who progressed into step two, 46% recovered normal functioning by the end of the program. However, when researchers conducted a three-month follow-up, it was noted that one half of the patients had a relapse in symptoms and quality of life. Trichotillomania should not be dealt with alone, and it is strongly recommended to seek help from professionals. But, given it is an underreported condition, it is important to be aware of self-help strategies. These strategies are squeezing a stress ball, forming a tight fist, using a fidget toy, wearing a bandana or a hat, repeat a phrase when the urge arises, take a soothing bath, practice deep breathing until the urge goes away, engage in exercise, wear gloves or plasters on your fingertips, and cut your hair short. Pay close attention to moments when you're most likely to pull your hair and consider reducing your time spent in those situations. Activities like driving, reading, paperwork, watching TV, and talking on the phone are often linked to hair pulling. As hair pulling is commonly associated with moments of solitude, it's advisable to increase your social interactions whenever possible. That just about wraps things up. I really believe that this is a truly debilitating disorder, and I wanted to shine a light on the personal challenges it brings. All of my references can be found in the description, and I encourage you to check them out. If you liked the video, please like and share. Leave a comment about your thoughts or experiences, and consider subscribing for more morbid content. Also, follow me on Instagram, at Sardine Macabre. Thank you for your time, and have a good day.